once more into the breach. You ready to pick up from where we left off in episode two? Ready as I'll ever be. So then we get into Thavnir, and I just want to open it up with just that. Just broad statement on Oriange and his feelings about, you know, like Moon's parents, his guilt, the love that weighs on him, and the way in which I'm so glad we get any catharsis around this, because it's kind of, it's not a dropped thread at all. It, like, it, it is touched on in Shadowbringers, it's clearly an important thread throughout, but we never get kind of a conclusion to that story, and the way it gets a catharsis in Endwalker is just chef's kiss. Uh, you've got a note on what? On Tancred's shouting what? <laughs> yeah, I literally just typed what? <laughs> it's uh, so good. I, while I was, I, I watched the cutscenes twice over. And when I, both times when nice. that happened, I, I, I laughed. <laughs> it's so good. The timing on a lot of the... There are some jokes that have, just have tremendous timing in Endwalker. Yeah, there are. It's a really... I mean, the Loperets are so funny. Oh my god, I love the Loperets. I can't get enough of their voice. We need to do. Oh yeah, they are so cute. I I thought I looked at their designs and I thought it's okay. Yeah. Oh, but then when you see them in action, they're so cute. Yes, they are so fucking adorable. I love so especially having played Final Fantasy IV. I fucking adored the side quest with Dreaming Way. I think where he's like, well, I know how to hum, and he start or like I know how to sing, do this thing with my singing, and like he starts humming, and it's the original. Yes. Uh, Hummingway sound from Final Fantasy IV, and I was just like, "Oh, that's so great! That's such a good use of that." Yes, I I love the um. In fact, I'd love to see more for like like dungeons that are allusions to four um going forward yes. on the moon. Uh, I appreciate how much four DNA is an Endwalker, but yeah, I would gladly take a lot more. My hope is some people have theorized that the four fiends might be the part of the trials. Yes, I I kind of agree with that, uh, and. I am so excited because the Four Fiends song is so good. I know it's already in, in FX, I mean, it does come up occasionally, um, a remix of it, but the, the theme is so good. Yeah, but also, like, now we've got full level soak in, like, going all out, so imagine what we might get this time. Exactly. When I when I first saw, I forget what his name is, the final boss of Pandemonium, um, when when you first see him appear Hespero. in... Hespero? Yes. Hespero? Something like that? Hesperos. Yeah. Hesperos. Hesperos. Yeah. Um, when you first see him appear, uh, I thought he was um, Rubicante. I was like, oh, but no. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. When you see him from behind. Yeah. Well, especially with the vibe of the arena, I'm like, Castlevania? And then he showed up, I'm like, oh, Alucard. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, I love the Lopperts a lot. They're so good. The way that, the way that, especially like the main one just says, Etheris. It just like, is so cute. <laughs> it's really adorable. It's just like, ah, my heart. I would also like to encourage everyone, no matter what you're doing right now, if you haven't already, please go and do the Pudding Wayside quest. Yes! Oh my god, the Pudding Wayside quest and Charlene are so good. Uh, they're really heartwarming too. I actually did it accidentally while looking for the Papalimo side quest. <laughs> <laughs> but I was happy about it. We're headed towards Thavnir, which is, we're going to use the brand new concept of Aetherites that are attuned to each other. Yes. Which I feel like is going to come back up in the future. I feel like that's whether it be oh there was a, a aetherite put in new the shipped to the new world or something. It's going to be like that's a thing. Yes. That I feel like it's we're not done with. I, I also feel I just need to jump in and say so. I've seen a lot of people on Reddit and on Twitter saying that probably not the people that watch these kinds of videos, but still saying that they don't understand why we're having to pay for aetherites. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that too, which uh, their confusion confuses me a little. Yeah, I understand that we're the saviors of uh, of the world multiple times over, so maybe we should get a pass, but uh, Aetherite is extremely, extremely uh, expensive to build. Um, they are important to control and defend. Uh, they're also pretty expensive to maintain, and they represent sort of a collaboration, at least in Eorzea. Uh, between Charlie and, and the, the nation that has them, uh, although there is some implication that some more some more modern ones are being built by Eorzeans. Yeah, but even those are still like facilitated by city states. And on top of that, you even in the e far east, you have the exact same relationship with the like Tenkoto and like yeah. the yeah yeah Onishishu. The uh, Onishishu, that's right. Um, yeah, and and these are it, it's a tariff. It's essentially just like. Like a, a toll road. To, to use it, you pay this toll that will be then used to maintain the... Yeah, like, it's, 
in universe it makes a lot of sense especially because like you don't want to have every person who's because in in canon what's basically there's someone there taking your money when you teleport in yeah there is someone next to you right and so like you don't want to have to tell them every time okay you're looking for this guy don't worry about this guy it's like no this, this is a reasonable thing to do in within the lore and then outside of the lore guys i don't know if you know this but inflation is bad and in mmos if you don't have a gill sink inflation happens which makes everyone's money mean nothing hey you took a six month break but now you come back and all your money is worth half of what it was worth yeah so gill sinks are very 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 important they are important and that's why like the like 50 million gill mount right like why that is important that they put in something like that they did with it was repairing like that was their main their original uh in initial solution to oh yeah in a wider sense yeah um so uh, anyway i just wanted to mention that because i've seen people talking about this and i think it's important to, to address um but yeah we arrive in thavna um to some very very funny scenes Yes. Well, even before that, we get you the final scene on Sh Charlian. What? <laughs> yeah. Tancred's little what? Because he's obviously experienced some Aether sickness before. Um, and just the way he delivers it, his voice actor is really talented. Um, just the way it's delivered is so, so funny. good. I don't know if I'm just like really biased and just love Final Fantasy or what. The voice actors that they have gotten for this game have been some of the best in anything I've ever played. They're like just they have been some of the best and some of the most appealing to just listen to. I think that um, Emmett Selk's voice actor particularly is really incredible. Oh my god, he's phenomenal. He's just next level. Uh, his ability to convey multiple emotions and shift between them without it seeming comedic or overwrought, except for when he clearly wants to make it feel overly dramatic, is yeah. is pretty good. Uh, even, like if you ever just want a, a great like microcosm of it i mean one you can just listen to all his map intros but his intro for the uh garlemald and him yes. talking about the magna glacius and stuff is a really good version of that it is yeah speaking of that though thavnair home oh, to city state, city state rods at home Rising from the southeast waters of the Bounty, this Isle of Plenty served as the battleground for a conflict between two peoples. Their cultures bled into one another until a unique amalgamation was distilled from the chaos, in a process not unlike their precious alchemy. Once solidified as a single nation, an adamant stance of neutrality would hold invaders at bay. For a time. Now across this vibrant isle creeps a fog of malice. What choice do you have? What chance? against such an insidious foe. Right, so Thavna, first of all, let me say I, I love Thavna. Um, I, I actually do think that the, the colored rocks, the pink rocks, don't work especially well with the graphics. Um, I think they're just a little too, there's a little too much saturation compared to the surrounding environment. Yeah, but I love the, the area, and I think the, the structures there are so beautiful. Yeah, I will say that if there's one environment to have such a thing, it is Thavnair, since Razat Han is so colorful and vibrant. Yeah. That the one thing I found too is using uh, certain programs that will not be named, adjusting my graphics. <laughs> the contrast, if I boost the contrast as a whole, it blends in a fuck ton better. Oh really? Because native, yeah. Because when the when the greens and everything else are more vibrant too. It, it be, just feels a lot more naturalistic. Like, it still stands out, but in a way where it feels like how it's more meant to, whereas it is a little bit jarring in the, like, purpley pink of the, of the um, yeah. giant skull. Yeah, like I said, I love that. Now. Um, and we get there and are introduced almost immediately uh, in the first few moments, the first, you know, the first... 20 minutes of having that to a really fascinating culture and a history that is extremely interesting. So the moment that you arrive in Tavna, you see this really fascinating culture, this really fascinating history. Um, essentially, you are told of this 
nation of waves of migration, originally inhabited by Arcosodra, Arcosodra um, then the Ra arrive, and then the Hyur arrive, and the conflicts and stuff that, that happen between them, and how these are, are mediated and brought to peace. Um, and of course, the uh, Matanga that we meet on the steppe um, are the, if you put it together, um, are the Gajasura are the uh, the Matanga that they talk about being exiled from Tadna, which you didn't know previously. We, we, we may as well have assumed that they were native to the step. Um, and just to explain real quick for, for other people, because I know like I, I didn't put it together, or not put it together, but kept it straight in my head. The Arkasodra and the, uh, I'm sorry, the Gasudra? What are they? The Gajasudra. Gajasudra um, are both Matanga. They're just two different groups of Matanga. The Matanga being the elephant people. Yes. And the Arkasodra stayed on Thabnir. The other group got kicked off. Yes. And we don't know fully where they went, but we know some of them ended up in the steppe. And the, part of the reason they seem to hate El Ra is because of the conflict between Matanga and El Ra in Thabnir's past. Yeah, because they were the ones that didn't want to make peace with the El Ra specifically. So they retained their sort of ancestral hatred. The, odd then that they chose to settle in the El Ra homeland, but... The um, G- Gajasodra, oh, goodness, uh, terrible apologies to anyone from South Asia. Um, uh, the Gajasodra are a reference to a specific type of demon in Hindu myth. The name is at least, oh. which means elephant demon. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, and they are killed by Shiva um, specifically. Well, and you have you know the whole you know elephants and also t- the fact that they you know, make the Matanga, or specifically you know, the Ark Soldier of Lou, you know, is not an accident. It's yes. Very intentional choice. Yeah, very much so. Um, we also learn about the religion. So there are two types of deities in in Thavna, uh, at least in the Ark Soldier of religion, um, which seems to have been adopted by most Hurons and, and um, Ara. There are the Manusha, which are gods with the bodies of men and the heads of beasts. And the Murga, I believe is how it's said, correct me if I'm wrong, gods with animal bodies and the heads of men. Yes, that sounds about right. Uh, I will be writing an article on these at some point. Um, I'll need to be collating plenty of stuff from different side quests in the, the MSQ, of course. Yeah, and the, we get surprisingly a lot about Thavnir like Charlene, Charlene, but we don't also get everything, and we don't know a metric shit ton of all about their gods even after doing all the side quests and everything right uh, I, we will learn about them in full in uh, in next encyclopedia yeah i'm fairly confident yes yes we will learn a lot about them i'm sure and if, uh, i have things that i'm wondering about giant skull as well but yes. the thing about the the one of the big things we do is we understand a little bit more about them by understanding the sisters right in the ways in which their masks are kind of representative of human body animal and animal head Yes. And also the sisters, um, Maga sisters, though, I don't believe, are they called that in? I don't the think they are. Um, no, but but they're basically the Maga sisters from Final Fantasy IV as well as Final Fantasy X. Although they're they're not really based off of either incarnation specifically. They're kind of the feeling, the vibe of both. They're allusions to um, to a bit of both. They, I, I think they also turn up in a few other games in, in much more minor ways. Um, and that there are sort of references. There's sort of a, an ag- a game agnostic reference to to the Mega Sisters. Yeah. So Estinian is a terrible haggler. Yes, uh, Estinian is like Alpha No level. It makes sense that they're like besties. Yep. <laughs> That's literally my note. Is Estinian is a terrible haggler, like Alpha No. Oh, not to not to go back, but to go back. Um, yeah. When we first arrive in Charlie, and I love the exchange that, or maybe before we leave, the exchange that Alpha No and Asinian have. That's right before you leave. Yep, where he's like, "You're Asinian." Yeah, and then Asinian threatens him with little Lord Alpha No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a great early point too, because like, let's say you're a lunatic and you played Endwalker first. That is a great way to sort of communicate relationships and ease tensions and make everyone feel familiarized immediately. Yeah. I mean, I'm really, I am extremely invested in Estinian and Alphano's friendship. I, I've yes. always loved the the trio and then the duo when, unfortunately, Zale died. Um, yeah. But they're a really interesting uh, group of characters. Yeah, I, I think that the the friendships and interdynamics across the scions are 
things that I really enjoy, like Kryle and Simeon and, you know, Thancred and Uriange clearly have a, you know, a good friendship, but it's, it's like a very stable friendship rather than being like this super special thing. It's just like, no, no, no. These are just guys who like can trust and know each other. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're also the two that are in some ways, which I know is going to be weird to say about Rianje, but are the most just dudes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's and, true. And, and in some ways, I think they're the closest to we get to the most canonically straight characters. <laughs> uh, I think... Um, I think when people... In the science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think when people look past Rianje's uh, parlance, how he speaks, um, he is actually like much less performative than perhaps yes i agree i i think that the theatrics come much more just in his stylings and manner yeah. than rather in that in that manner rather than any although speaking of theatrics the joy that him playing with his new cards in tatara's new outfit in the at the end of yes. shadowbringers gave me that was so good yeah 5.3 i still hold that that 5.3 final cutscene is one of the best in ways that like best encapsulation of characters in a brief period of time that i think i've ever seen it was really good all their personalities are just immediately on display. Well, we then arrive at the place where we meet one of my favorite, well, two of my favorite NPCs of the, I've got so many favorite NPCs, I guess, uh, but um, of this, of this X pack where we meet Nadana, Nadana and Varshan. Yes. I love how much Varshan is yet a, a great foreshadowing, right? His eyes his like, like you're immediately drawn to be like, okay, something's up with him clearly, but you're not entirely exactly sure what, and so when they, for me at least, when he they revealed the truth of him, I'm like, yep, that makes sense. That yeah. tracks. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, when I, I really found it interesting how they sort of explain the mechanism of it with the eye though. Yes. Um, but I find it extremely funny that the devs have been telling us for like, since Heaven's Ward that no, the aura aren't dragony. They're, they're almost more demony. They've just got scales. <laughs> now they're like, but this one. <laughs> but this one literally is. This one literally is a dragon. I feel like, I don't want to say they've gone back on the whole demon thing versus dragon thing, but I feel like there have been tentative steps a little bit more towards like tying them to dragons. Um, not not explicitly, not like, oh, they're in any way descended from dragons, but just like things like this with Varshan, right? I think it's an interesting thing. I, I think maybe it depends culturally. Um, yeah. You know, you the Ishgardians might see them more as dragony that the Tafnarians certainly would, will now at least. Um, and uh, but certain other cultures might see them as, as slightly more demonic. I, I think it's more of a cultural. I don't think they're actually related. I, I definitely don't think they're related to Voidsen. I will be very shocked. No, 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 no. Uh, no and I, no. I don't really think they're related uh, sort of obliquely to, to dragons either. But it's possible. I'm sure that there's some stuff going on with pre sundering Atheris to do with or <laughs> Yeah. I well, pre sundering there's so many questions left to both interrogate with what we do know and to investigate with what we don't. One of the things that I really like that sort of they get out with Vritra and just the sort of the dragons and everything around Thabner is something that Yoshi P said, which is that each of the maps, most of the maps, have a direct reference and connection to one of the prior expansions. So with, you know, Thavnir, you get Heaven's Word. With Garlemald, you get Stormblood. With Elpis, you get Shadowbringer. I think you could argue in a lot of ways the connections between Char uh, Charlian and Louis Swa and 2.0. And then you look at, um, you can look at, so Mar Mari Lamentorum is kind of its own. It's clearly sort of just its own thing. It's, you could say it's Endwalker, but Ultima Thule is ultimately definitely Endwalker. Um, yes. I just love that there's sort of parallels that are in mind with each of those. Yeah, Mary L Lamentorum. I mean, I guess you could say 1.0 because it's about moons, um, but... <laughs> yeah, well, and, and about Zodiac and mm -hmm. Astians. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, I, I, I definitely like... I, I agree that Yoshi has achieved his mission of doing so. Uh, Thavnad does feel like... It ha harkens back to... Heaven's Ward in many ways. Uh, I, th I think a Sinian being there, at the very least, sort of emphasizes that. But Absolutely. it's um, it's a very interesting, very, very novel type of callback because it it it's what would have happened maybe if the Dragon Song War hadn't occurred. 
Yeah, it is a callback while also a moving forward of the future, while also seeing how things could have been different without needing to say they should have been different. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's a lot of things. It's not just here's this is the place where dragons are. So obviously heaven's word. It's like, no, no, no. It's, it's because of like the more important thing beyond Istinian and Ritra being a dragon is the relationship in which they have to each other is the callback to Heaven's Word. Now, they have that because Reach is a dragon and that legacy, but but the point being, it's not just here be dragon. Yeah. I would imagine that um, Retta Tosca loved Thavna uh, mm. back when she was alive, because she really, she was, she was you know, the, the big proponent of, of men and dragons mm. working together. I also, I, before uh, Endwalker came out, when there was only the trailer, I don't know why, but my assumption was Reacher was just going to be much more young in spirit and like kind of like a go-getter and more like not like a this like ancient being with great responsibility looking out right. for his culture, which I was I was a pleasant surprise. It wasn't in any way. I was just like I had been expecting a much more like I was expecting a little bit more young, non-human hating Nidhogg than I was um, right human loving Hraysvilger. Right. I think what was what we're given to learn about Retta Tosca is that she's the the younger child of the of the family. She's the the one that's eager and manic a little bit and runs around and yeah. does all sorts of things according to her own whims. Um, Which is interesting because Vritra states he's the youngest. Yes, he does. But I mean, you know, I I suppose what does that really mean in terms of the clutch? How, how much time was between each of their hatchings? Right. Uh, what, what, what when you live thousands of years? What's the difference between even a year? Your, yeah. your disposition of yourself is the most important thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm really curious because all of the other dragons went in pairs: uh, Tiamat and Bahamut, uh, and well, uh, and uh, in groups. And then there was the trio of Fresvalga, Nidhog, and Rastoska. So I'm really interested where Azdasha is. Yeah, I'm really, really interested to figure out where Azdasha is. In I think my guess is New World. I would have to assume New World. Because it's the one place we don't know much of. Tiuma and Bahamut were in Marisidia. We would know if if he was in Marisidia, if they were in Marisidia. So I I think that's the widely sort of like held idea is that's where they are. Which makes me wonder what is up with them. Like like what what not just like what what are they doing, but like what is their disposition? Because we've seen the dragons take such the first brood take such different takes on everything. Yeah, I mean, we don't have much idea about what Bahamut was like in life. Um, we know about Tiamat, obviously. Um, she seems to be sort of a level-headed, uh, although, you know, her most defining feature was her losing her head and, and summoning Bahamut, but... But only under extreme circumstances. Yeah, like, the most under, like, the absolute worst uh, possibility. Yeah, we see Ratatoska, well, we read about Ratatoska being, you know, sort of manic, uh, a little bit childish figure, almost. That might not be the fairest term for her, but... Um, Chris Felger is this. Soul. Yeah. Chris Felger is a soulful, wise, kindly dragon. Uh, and Nidhogg is obviously. He was wary and sort of wary and distant before the Dragon Song War. And now he's. Well, after that, he was sort of a, a bit more vicious and aggressive and rage filled. So there is a range of personalities. None of them are, are too, dissim- too similar to each other. So I'd really yeah. love to see what Astagia is like. Yeah, I'm very excited for that too. So then we have where we go to the great works. We're talking with Nadana. Nadana's awesome. She is awesome. She's so good and and extremely funny as well. The scene is so funny when they all wake up. Yes, I lo- oh, and the the scene after it, towards the end of that where uh, they're all like encircling around Astinian and dragging uh, him away. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good. And and sort of touching more on Bridra and. Uh, you know, Varshan at the time, but Vistinian, you know, the way in which they both recognize each other immediately without fully understanding each other, and the way in yes. which Istinian is such an interesting thing to come across for a dragon because he bears Ratatuskar's armor and the blood of Nidhogg on his spear, while also having the soul of a dragon, partially. Yeah. Yeah, and we know that the most people in Ishgard have Ratatuskar's blood in their blood as well, just innately. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So it must be sort of a, a dazzling thing to come across, both in a negative and a positive sense. Um, and, you know, Vashan is immediately wary, and Estinian is immediately wary as well, because someone comes, coats it. I mean, one of the uh, one of the researchers literally says, uh, just walks up and says, 
this is dragon blood on your spear, don't they? <laughs> yep, yep. And kicked on your armor, and I'm just like, oh, awkward. <laughs> Rough. Yeah, uh, but what I do love is, it, and it, it it isn't technically immediate in the sense that, like, obviously this first meeting, they don't necessarily, they're a little bit aware of each other. Yeah. But how with so few words and so few statements in, at all between them, the trust that is immured and the way in which they are able to connect in a way that no other character quite is with Richa. Like, Richa's on your side, you're connecting with him, you're, but, like, the way in which he is... There's a special connection that, that they have. And and it, you see it later on, obviously, you know, in the beginning of the final days of the, and how they mm. fight together. Yeah. But there's two things, one of which that I love is is that when Sidney starts to walk away when later on when you're in the chamber of, of Ritra, and he's like, well, basically something until the effect of, will you not lend your aid? And Isidian doesn't just say like, oh, no, no, I will. He, he says, is, I do not, like, it's not, doesn't matter to me if you are asking as a great worm or if you're asking as the leader of Razda Han, you know, I will help you. And like, it's such a subtle nuance thing, but the fact that he clarifies it is not because, oh, you protect this land, I will protect it too. It is, if you ask me as a great drake, I will still stand by your side. You know? Yeah, and I think he's... He's definitely made growth. I mean, Tia, him flying with Tiamat on its own was pretty significant. Yeah, well, and the way that he becomes the ultimate call to arms and ability, the the only person who could reach through to Vritra once the final days begins, right? The fact that he's the one capable of that it just shows so much, not just in yeah. growth, but in something more. And I think it's great because you get to, it's not just you go from Heaven's Word to Endwalker where he's doing that, but you have some really beautiful moments throughout Five Point X's patches like that moment after Arnvold falls and he not only says, I will join you, but he explains to Alphano how he is a pragmatist, how, how East Indian is a pragmatist, how he doubts, how he worries, how he doesn't necessarily think these things are possible, but he looks to them. He looks to the scion and sees the truth in their action and how they disprove him time and time again. How could I, how could he not hold the hope in the face of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's worth... This is, I suppose, not discussed over much in the, the game itself. I mean, it is a little bit. But it, it's worth noting, Asinian, his family were personally killed by Nidhogg. Nidhogg himself killed them. So it, this this growth of being able to, to work alongside, and not just work alongside, but see the value and its sort of inherent human humanity, for want of a better word, in a, in a great worm. It, it's yeah. definitely huge progress. Well, and that's why one of the videos I'm proud of that I made um, before Endwalker was sort of just this little diatribe, though, on the importance of understanding in the Endwalker trailer why Istinian and Vritra fighting side by side matter so much. Because yeah. it is not just this cool thing. When you understand the fact that the Heaven's Word themes plays, right? And that the Heaven's Word theme, Heaven's Word theme explains the fundamental tragedy and conflict between man and dragon. Yes. And then it plays again with Estinian and Vritra standing side by side at the end of the world, defending their shared home. Yeah. That's like, it's not, that is not necessarily singularly Endwalker's thematic statement, but it is a cathartic coming home of heaven, Heaven's Words mm. themes within Endwalker under the auspices of Endwalker's primary motivation and themes. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean the, the, the musical themes that run throughout, I mean, obviously it, the expansion is about a song at its heart, but the, the musical themes that run through it are so, so impactful. And I'm a sucker for a story about magic songs. And I have been ever since I uh, read anything to do with Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Tolkien, quite a fan. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the underpinning of Arda is a song. Yep. It was created by a song. Um, yeah, and Delindale, the song of creation. Yeah, so I mean, I just I love that kind of trope, and I, I sort of the actual themes that are explored by this game using its music is really, really incredible, really impactful. That's the thing, right? Is how much the music stands on its own, and but it doesn't just needs to stand on its own. It, it heightens and elevates, and is a character on its own, providing such an enhancement to the story while also actually being sometimes lyrically thematic thematically appropriate and relevant but often even without lyrics able to do that like yeah. um just uh the uh graha's theme wins um eternal wins mm. uh final fantasy 3 
means so much when you understand its purpose. And it's partly because so many of the songs are, I guess, not technically leitmotif, more just motif, but they so many leitmotifs kind of exist within the game. Yeah, I mean, they love to use answers as a leitmotif. Oh my god, yeah. I mean, and Endwalker, most of all, but even throughout, you know, even earlier in, in uh, Binding Coils. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that they weave it in with, like, I'm sure it appears in Stormblood in some form. Oh yeah, and the thing, too, the, that I meant to get at earlier with, like, the Elpis Flowers playing is that they have that musical theme that kind of, it's not specifically Medion's theme. I kind of call it the Entelechi theme. That is just, yeah, I like, see that. the beautiful piano piece that plays at multiple points usually around the elpis flower though not exclusively so and yes which is kind of why i call it the entelechi theme because it usually plays with us with the flower or with median ergo entelechis yes. but the that oh my god that sets the stage so much and it plays at the end when nidana is talking to us about uh akasha and yeah uh, so if we pass over like a nidana so if we get to sort of the next cut scene which is starts with uh, a so well fan daniel sitting upon a rock staring down upon yeah. everything and yes. he starts talking and one of the things that's cool is that he references owen who's uh the guy who helps us under figure out the primal thing from allegan records in 5.5 yes. 5 or 5.4 it's one of those um, and I, which is a really cool nod, and you're like, oh, I know that reference, but if you realize that that's alluding to the reveal to come about Van Daniel's true identity, uh, yeah. that he would know that. And the thing I really love, too, is that the scene starts in Asahi's voice and turns into Amon's voice. Yes, yeah, the, the voice acting was really good around, uh, around Van Daniel. Yeah, and the thing that I really like about that it, that I like that it transfers is it transfers back to Asahi before you know the truth. So it's not just like, oh, all of a sudden it's like, okay, and we're doing this for the rest of the game. It's more like, oh no, Van Daniel's finally revealing his end game and his full self. Yes. And I just think that that's cool. The other thing that I, this is kind of not necessarily Van Daniel specific, but I love that Amon and Hermes are the same voice actor, but the performance is so different. They are very, very different. The attitude, like, there's, you can, they're clearly delineated two separate characters, and I love that. Yes. And the, Amon sort of points out his, because, like, sort of because of his curiosity and stuff, he's his own worst enemy, wanting nothing more than for it, for everything to sort of end. It kind of ties into his nihilism, too. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, we can talk about, obviously, and we will talk about the fact that Endwalker represents uh, a number of different forms of nihilism. Yes. There are a number of characters to whom this nihilism means different things. Uh, of course, um, Amon included. I'm going to use Van Daniel as like an umbrella term, but refer yeah. to Amon and um, Hermes separately because they are, of course, different people. Um, yes. Yes. And for all of all of Amon's flaws, which are many innumerable perhaps um i think that's you know he is worthy of that recognition as just uh, by being a person which i think is something that that ender walker uh, tries to emphasize as well um just some general notes about stabner before we get into like the story stuff um i uh really want to know more about the sword in stabner you know, that big yes. the, the massive chunk of crystal um slash stone uh, I, I wonder if we might get a dungeon or something with it, um, or if it's um, if we get the four um, four fiends. I wonder if maybe one of them has something to do with it. Oh, that's a good idea. That'd be interesting. I'm also extremely interested. So, so dragon scales don't fully having a dragon scale with you doesn't make you immune to tempering, but they they are sort of conducive to that and do seem to have some energy. But we have seen tempered dragons. The way I read that is that the alchemical processes are what actually facilitates the warding, but what dragon scales do canonically are two things, one of which is that they're really good etheric conductors um, and may, may have just been part and parcel to uh, facilitating whatever protection magics the alchemical process allowed for. Mm -hmm. They're also incredibly strong, and it may be that the literal... Um, often there's a thing, it, like, like with the anima quest, where the vessel for etheric magics and for powerful things need the vessels need to be strong enough otherwise they break under the weight of what they're supposed to do and it may just be that the dragon skills are one of the only materials that would have been strong enough right and, and like yes giant skull would have been strong in a great etheric conductor but that they even that might not have been strong enough right okay without the addition of dragon scales 
Uh, my final point was I really want a hamster mount uh, that I wrote while I was playing through the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could go, you could get to the top of Heaven on High four times and get the Dodo mount, which is basically yeah. a hamster. It is basically, but I want a, a green stupid orb. Um, <laughs> Everyone I've talked to has loved that thing. Oh, it's so good. I mean, th th it doesn't even control particularly well, but it, it's charming. So, I think it's very intentional in the way it controls. Yes, yes, it is. It is. It is a touch of flavor, if nothing else. Yes. From there, we have that moment sort of by the tide where you are stand, sitting there, and I think we've alluded to this in multiple ways throughout, but the, you're standing there with Uriange, Thancred, and Asinian, and talking about, kind of about suffering and hope. And it's yeah. this sort of a beautiful moment, and it's, it's, it's this, you know, it's, it's one more, again, setting up of the conflict, which is hope versus nihilism, and the reality of existence and why existence is a struggle. Yeah, and Astinian talks in that conversation about how losing hope can make you a, a dangerous, aggressive, or threatening person. Yeah, he has a line, something of like, um, vengeance is sown in this that in the soil of like despair. Yeah, um, yeah, which is uh, specifically what we see, you know, with Meteon is, is this this danger that this this lashing out at the world in response to. Uh, the sense of overwhelming, overwhelming despair. Yeah. And one thing I liked too about that scene is again, is there are three people talking about the same thing, but you know, Estinian's focus is on vengeance and, and, and a bit more about like his personal experience. Thancred is thinking, I think about all the he's lost and Uriange is kind of more focused on hope and the future. And so even though they're all talking about the same thing, even though I all believe this come to the same conclusion, they're all very different cadences and perspectives on it. Like you have, or thank you, even thing saying, you know, I sometimes have enough frustration and hatred to, you know, want to burn it all down. He has the line, uh, the will to endure is not always strong as the urge to burn it all down. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because I think different people, I think a lot of people are going to relate to that, right? But I think everyone's going to have different amounts to which they relate to different characters take on hope and nihilism. But what matters is not that different take. That what matters is that we share the conviction to carry on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I, I, and I know that that is not the. This is not a responsibility that can be put on Endwalker, and it's not something that they intended necessarily. But I think that for people who are struggling, the expansion could provide a valuable resource for seeing how one might move past this type of thing. Absolutely, it's one of those things where it's like. Like, yes, being, oh, you're depressed? I'm going to hand you an MMO. is not, like, that's not a... <laughs> <laughs> but there's something to be said that if there was a person in my life who I know that they were able to engage with the story like that, I think it could do a lot. I think I think the entire journey to Endwalker could do a lot, and then I think Endwalker would be, as a culmination, a really, yeah. a really powerful note. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, I mean, th these are p traumatized people. Thancred is deeply traumatized. His own childhood, even before we sort of get to the, the, the more profound trauma, is pretty severe. Oriange, of course, has struggled with Moe and Breeda and has, you know, been through some pretty hardcore stuff with us. Um, and of course, Estinian, as as many Ishgardians are, were, will be, uh, until the next generation is born, are deeply traumatized by the Dragon Song War and the results of that and what they've had to do in it. Absolutely. From there, we go to basically the tower. Dodonna gets captured. There's not a lot to say, really, until we get to, well, arriving inside and talking to Fan Daniel. There's not a lot to say, but I do have to say, I do have to mention that the entire time that we were rowing towards that tower and then walking towards the door, and Nidana's yep. like walking back, as I'm like, no, no, <laughs> like either fucking story please go ahead and just grab her and let us end this waiting this inter interminable <laughs> suffering of just like oh god something's gonna happen this is going back a little bit again but yeah, i did yeah. really like how when asahi is well no sorry when for daniel aman is sat looking at the the people in the great work um and he's talking about how he really should go down there and stop their their making of these talismans um yep but then he, he has the line uh, as, a, as ever, I am my own worst enemy. Yes. I just, yep. I like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm on Van Daniel's really like stupid and self-indulgent and, and not particularly engaged in character because he doesn't have any, you know, investment in, in the world. But I don't know, I just find him fun. I think he's a, a fun character. I think he's engaging. Well, 
and I agree. I think he. I think he's engaging in and of its own right. But I think that's the tragedy, though, right? Like understanding that is the tragedy. The reason he's his own worst enemy is because, yes, he has the conviction to say nothing matters, but in the end, what does it even matter to him if he stops them or not? He's like, yes, I want to burn it all down. I want to take you all with me. Fuck it all. But also, like, I don't have anything other than saying, well, I guess let's see what happens. I, I think it, to me that is not an, um, him being look at me, I'm so kooky. It's him being like, I guess we'll see. You know, like, just like to all of existence. And, and I think that's further, you you see that when you defeat him. He was returning to the ethereal scene. He's like, was this the answer I wanted? Was this the answer? He's not just like grieving like, oh, I got my way. Was it right? It's more than that. He's like, this entire time he's been like, yeah, I, I do think fuck it all. But, but even that doesn't fulfill me. Even that does nothing for me. Even that does nothing. Yeah. What is the fucking point and his utter despair and nihilism in feeling like what is the fucking point is yeah what what is tragic about him and yeah. so for me i think that is a moment of 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 be even further understanding that tragedy yeah i also so obviously when a sundered member of the, the convocation takes on a uh, one of the memories from the stones um, it's not them becoming that person. It, it, it's oh, imparting I have a of, bunch about this. Yep. It's it's imparting of memories, and I think also maybe there's also some slightly deeper impartment from the stone, but it's mostly memories. But I do wonder if perhaps his, as ever I am, my worst enemy. I'll see how this bears out. Is perhaps just the faintest echo, subconscious echo of Hermes' personality that made him say, uh, "Let's have a fair test. I'm going to wipe everyone's yep. minds and see how you proceed with this." So the thing I think that's super, super fucking important about this, and I'll, I'll go over this now then, is um, when someone is ascended with a stone, the stones only contain the memories of the person from their time on the convocation. And that is really important to understand because it means that Van Daniel has a very limited subsect of Hermes' memories, experiences, and disposition. So the majority of stuff he's working on once ascended because Hermes w was only on the convocation for a short period before the final days began. Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, we did, we're not entirely sure how long it took Meteon to set up and to start to no, to do what she it, did, but it can't have been too seems, long. It seems pretty implied that the final days, the final days may have taken a little bit to fully kick off, but it seems, it, it, I personally think it's very heavily implied that the final days did not take too long before their arrival, um, especially in the timeline and life of a agent. And... The thing is, is that that means that Hermes was likely the last, if not one of the last, to become the Van Daniel, to become, to achieve their seat. Because it doesn't seem like it happened yeah. that rapidly. Outside of Elidibus, um, definitely. Outside of Elidibus. But the thing is, is that if that's the case, the memories within the crystal would be relatively limited. So Amon's personality, disposition, and self would have been much stronger than the limited memories that he would have garnered from Hermes, Hermes Stone. He then yeah. also has separately the echoes of memory yeah um, that we see when we like mention Medion and we mention like which is is fully separate to his knowledge of hermes and, and his time on the complications of so it's just i i think it's very very important to understand how much amon is a separate character of hermes even if his soul might predispose him to certain similar dispositions or even have echoes of memory yes yeah, definitely. I, I think there is an element of predisposition there, but I don't think it's necessarily vastly, you know, it, it's not a significant thing, but I think it, may, it might occasionally peek through. My my read, this is a personal read, but my read on the predisposition stuff is it predisposed him for the creation of life, which is why Amon kind of does the shit he does. Yeah. It, I think it also personally predisposed him to compassion which, if you grew up with an alag at the height of its decay, would having a conflicting feeling of compassion in a world utterly so sadistic would fuck with you and break you. And so yeah. I think that that's also part of the tragedy of Amon. Is I yeah, don't think I Amon needed to be the sadist he was. Yeah. No, I agree with you. He, um... Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, well, the my, my take on the sort of reincarnation thing that's throughout this is that, you know, and speaking from a psychologist background, um, mm -hmm. from my training in developmental psychology, the, the science indicates that it's not nature or nurture, it's nature and nurture. So I think yeah. this is where we're coming from. You are, you are born, uh, not the same person, but a similar slate to 
past incarnations and then your life writes a different person onto that well and i think that everything we learn about azem proves that like everything about the warrior of light and azem proves that while they are and not the same person and tenzin proves that while they are not the same person they are all predisposed to the same things yeah yeah, oh, and for viewers, I just want to make clear, Tenzin isn't confirmed to be a previous Warrior of Light, but we are going to treat him in our minds as similar, essentially confirmed, but we don't want to convey to you that he is confirmed, because that's not true yet. Thank you for doing that. Yes, we act that way because there's not just a reference. There's not just two references. There are about 12 separate references in the Auspice Quest line that kind of obliquely imply that. And his abilities also obliquely apply that. And there's a couple moment. There's at least one moment at the end that gets perilously close to explicitly like nodding yeah. at the idea that he is. So, and and when the devs are doing that, at that point, I'm like, ah, okay, I'm just gonna assume that because because you may or may not ever confirm that, but but we'll work with that as a working theory. But yes, I yeah. think that is a good thing to distinguish that this is a theory, not a hypothesis, a theory. Yes. So that actually is the biggest moment in a way, though, of this th this part of our uh, end talkers it is kind of the reveal of Amon. And the and yes, I, we were both talking about this at some point, but we were both, of course, we like the moment it, it reveals like, of course. Yeah, I was kicking myself. It, it felt so obvious that he was Amon. The, the, the the personalities are similar that the the theatrics, the even down to like the, the Luna primals and how he created them is it, you could see illusions there just yeah. everything about him it, it the but then again i wasn't thinking about amon so you know in fairness to us the thing that fucked with me is i read a thing by someone that said they why they thought emmet selk or why amon was a previous emmet selk which i didn't agree with and part of it was based in the fact that that's not how clones work and we've had yes. a whole we have had a whole talk about uh, we've had about two or three yeah yeah which uh, we'll, well, I'm sure we'll cover again at some point. For for but but needless to say, it doesn't matter. It still works. But it, clones his, historically don't have personalities unless you imbue them with part of your soul. And so there's a couple ways around that for Ben Daniel. Uh, yeah. But that was what made me historically predisposed to not think Amon was a uh, in any way related to an Asian. But yeah, I, I think it, it makes so much goddamn sense. It does make sense, and I can see why people might say Emmett Selk, because we know that, and you know, Zand Amon is the one who resurrects Zande, who who propels it into a calamity causing civilization. Yeah, um, Emmett Selk we know was involved with propelling Alec towards that, and you know we see that Emmett is involved with it when he's talking to Amon in the flashback. Uh, but yes. It, I yeah, he makes much more sense as Fandemio than Emmett. Um, One detail I really like is, you know how Emmett's wearing his mask in that? Yes. Part of it is because he couldn't have the soulless face. So, like, uh -huh. because that he wouldn't have existed at that point in time. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, I was like, why are they putting the mask on him here? Oh! Yeah, because he, he doesn't have the same body that we used to. I wonder what he would have looked like back then. Yeah, that's a great question. It's just, it's Hildebrand. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> I'll go in and hack the files and just like the big reveal. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also one of, so one of the things too that's cool about it being a mon is like they're really using the crystal tower being required to its fullest. Yes. It wasn't required upon Shadowbringer's release to play the crystal tower, which is insane to me. I know. But it was required as of the last patch of it, wasn't it? 5.3. Because 5 .3. you had to have by the time you Elidibus came out. I know that. Yeah. And that's just you putting that to full use. Though I can still imagine there are plenty of people who are like, he says, I am Amon. And someone would be like, who's Amon? <laughs> like, I could tell, yeah. there, you know, there were a couple of more than a couple of people who are like, uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And I understand that. Yes. I do. But it, I mean, at least they go back and they, 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 they highlight it, right, in a flashback yes. afterwards. Um, they give you the context of. of his time like the thing is, is even if you don't know who it is at all like you're saying the information that's important is conveyed to you right then and there yeah it is they make sure to do that could you give me like a brief history of amon real quick for anyone who's sort of unfamiliar with it right okay so amon is an elegant was an elegant so the elegant empire this mighty very technical technologically advanced empire rose into prominence first under the emperor zande uh, and then he 
under later empires managed to expand itself, but its technological prowess became so sort of immense that it just automated society. It still, it wasn't like everyone was living an idyllic life. There were still underclasses and conquered peoples who were treated very poorly, but for the elegant elite, for the elegant people that who were sort of native to around Silvertia Falls, um, they were tr- just very lazy, very hedonistic. Everything was done for them. And Amon is born into this period of elegant history and very quickly becomes discontent. He sees that it's it's taking Alec in a non-sustainable way. So he goes to the tomb of Zande, this first emperor, this great conqueror, and resurrects him uh, with uh, just the, the worst possible sort of chimeric magics uh, and sciences. And in doing so, he makes Zande three things. Alive again, extraordinarily physically powerful and insane. Um, it, the process of being brought back to life drives him absolutely insane. Uh, and he becomes sort of the second in command of the elegant empire uh, and, and very cruel. He like he sneaks up on people while they're sleeping and twists them into horrible monstrosities. Um, Tilla, the second boss of um, well, the first boss of, of Crystal Tower, he she's terribly scared of dogs and she's the, the court mage of Zande. And he, so he attaches dog heads to her body to traumatize her presumably um a driver insane and that's where we pick up on him essentially is is him in this phase of his life when he's sort of maniacal and deeply cruel and capricious uh, and this is when we meet amon and that's when he's ascended into the role of van daniel right exactly um amon is is a, an interesting character and if you, if you don't know much about him then i would encourage you to go and I don't know. He's got an entry on the site in the Circus Tower bestiary article, um, and I'm sure that there will be content about him uh, on the YouTube channel as well at some point. Oh, well, very besides much. this, and there's also Encyclopedia or a Volume One, which yes. they're printing currently, and that is a great source for a lot of the stuff we know about him. It is yes. The other thing I love about the use of Amon and the use of Zande is how much Zande's story was about nihilism as well. And so it becomes it, him appearing in Endwalker is not just a nod. It actually serves a very story driven function. Like why part of why Amon would end up the way he is, is because of how he idolized Zande, how he served mm-hmm. her. Do you remember about two or three weeks before Endwalker came out, we were discussing why entirely independently, why Amon wanted it to be an apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't recall that at all. Oh, oh really? God. No. Oh, we we were discussing it. Um, it might have been in the after talks of a law of a law talk. Um, I'm definitely gonna put those out. There's uh, after hours up. Uh, yeah, so. there's some predictions for for Endwalker that we make in the in the original ones, uh, which are not entirely correct, but I think we can be forgiven. With how much Elpis, Median, and other elements that we could have never really predicted came into play, I. F- feel that we made reasonable assumptions for the puzzle pieces we had at hand with no ability to really know what puzzle pieces might be added. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, on the topic of Crystal Tower requirement, I would love for them to roll it out to more raids. Uh, keep on doing it. Give us more Damascan content. Give us more Void Art content. Give us more Marquee content. Um, yeah, keep it coming. I, 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 I'm of two minds. Because on the one hand, I think it's great that people are allowed to choose. I, if anything, what I think what I would prefer is that they require something like Omega. And I would, I, they can't require Binding Coils because of how, how it is currently. They just can't. Yeah. That, Cause it's just, it's, it, it's too much of a requirement for someone to play. Like if you unsync it, sure. But that you're, you're not going to require someone to unsync something, especially if you need to be Binding Coils in order to play Heaven's Word. Cause you're not going to be at 90 and able to unsync. In short, yeah. binding coil, requiring Binding Coils does not work. However, the importance of Alexander and Omega to Shadowbringers is such that it's in some ways a travesty in my mind that they are not required. Oh yeah, I mean, doing the doing the you must have been really confused doing the Ultima Thule stuff and the Delta Scape stuff without having done Omega, right? That must be extremely confusing. Oh yeah, I can only imagine what that must have been like for for that. I haven't met, I haven't met someone who's occupies that space yet. I think the longer the game's out, the more likely you'll see that though, because 
if you're someone who played during Stormblood or Shadowbringers, like, well, eventually you might have gotten around to it once. It's like, okay, you did it. At the least you've osmosed that information. Yeah. I'm torn because I want there to be able to people to have the choice, but also normal raids are so easy that requiring them I don't think is a big problem. Alliance raids, you mean, or... Or, sorry, alliance raids and, norm well, no, and normal raids, because I'm because Omega and Alexander would be requiring those would be normal raids. They, they are easy, but I, they're, they're both so easy. Um... The only really hard raids are like you know outside of Savage, of course. This is that, that that's an entirely different kettle of fish. Is binding coil, which can be done unsynced fairly easily now, with the exception of Twintani, can be a little difficult. Nail is a real pain in the ass. And yeah, having done it synced, um, it is its regular approaches Savage difficulty. Yeah, uh, and so it that's the thing is like there is no normal raid for Bahamut because the normal yeah. raid is functionally Savage. Yeah, I did the um. So I, when I when when ARR was out, I did up to Twintani, didn't clear Twintani. Then I, I I later did up to, well, I, I later then went and back and did the coil, and I've done unsynced all of the first round of coil, and then I did unsync three people nail, which was still pretty difficult. That fight is hard. Um, yeah, yeah. Tw Twintania is a little hard, but can be done one person. Um, yeah. Nail has mechanics that make it very difficult the fewer people you have. Yeah. Uh, I managed to do it via the use of you know the the, the paladin gap closer essentially. Yep. Uh, but the final coil has about two fights that are really 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 difficult to solo, including Bahamut, of course. Yeah, it's a lot easier now that it's ninety because I did do Bahamut ninety solo. Um, yes. For a yeah. Shot at some point, but yeah, it, it's still. But it's still the thing is unsinking. As much as I'm super glad it's an option and a huge proponent for it, like it's not the way that the best way to experience a content, but for a lot of people it's gonna yeah. be their only option for coils, and that just sucks. It does. The um unsinking isn't necessarily the best worked out with it works okay with normal raids. Obviously you can't unsync alliance raids, which is kind of a pain when it comes to collecting footage and sh like Oh my god, you yep. For uh -huh. me, it's a real pain collecting images, and I'm assuming it's the same for you with footage. I have to do it and then press return and go through and, and take the pictures I want. Um, I had to do Shadows of Mach. Yeah. So many times it was... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Just to, just to get like... I mean, usually I would batch the shots so I wouldn't just have to do go, do it to get one shot, but I had to like do the void arc. <laughs> oh my god. I, and yeah. what happened a couple times is I'd do it <laughs> and then I'd get to the end and auto exit because there's muscle memory. Yeah, I've done that before. I've done that with... Um, <laughs> Crystal Tower before, which obviously isn't too difficult. Although yeah. the time that I did it, uh, the team had wiped tons under his meteors. So I don't think I've ever wiped in any of the Crystal Tower raids. Uh, I wiped uh, in World of Darkness back in ARR, but um, okay, I lie. I have wiped in World of Darkness. That yes, that has happened. It does feel like a slightly separate raid to the to the other two. Um, There's more mechanics that require actual coordination, whereas you can bypass so much of those in the Labyrinth of the Ancients and in Sirius Tower. Now, having kind of like wrapped up the majority of Amon stuff, we kind of leave there. We kind of eat ourselves out because we can't save Nidana because to remove her would just kill her. So instead, we have to take down the tower. So yes. when we get there, we get the lines from himself. A vast, vast rock, rock squats, squats upon Favnir. Favnir. And to its stony surface clings the city of Rods at Han. Ye who enter here are subject to the scrutiny of gods, the gate's most watchful eye. The orb which beholdeth the truth of all things. Pass beneath its hot and piercing gaze, bearing down like a second midday sun. The fragrant haze, a mixture of sweet incense and acrid smoke. The cries of merchants mingled here with lively melodies accented by dancers' feet. 
travelers seduced by vivid sound and colors were once swallowed up by patchwork streets. But no such scenes to savor now. To what somber present does that divine eye bear witness? So, there's not a lot there other than like stuff about the divine eye. Uh, I love that they use the dragon's music for Ritra. Like it's like, yeah, of course, like that makes sense. But it, it's just, it's such an easy touch to that may have been missed. Like no music may have been there, or just generic music may have been there. But the fact that throughout your arrival with the satrap and talking to Ritra, the music is appropriate for the context of what's going on. Just yes, yeah. and and I really like that the satrap isn't introduced and then uh, sort of discarded. Um, yes, he remains. Yeah. yeah, he remains a really kindly, really quite adept actually at ruling despite not ruling um, figure. And his his death later on is pretty emotional by my yeah. understanding. Yeah, I it really is really impactful to like me like it's it's part of the reason it's impactful is because the final days is just brutal brutal and gruesome like in a, in a definitional sense and then the other part of it is also because of the things he stood for and, and that his legacy does matter yeah definitely uh, and and this is you know hammered home by by Vritra by the other have names that they are thankful to Ahawan that's his name right yes yep yeah, they're thankful to him, that they're appreciative of him, that they respect him. Yeah, there's a way in which he may be a figurehead, absolutely, but there is an absolute connection, trust, and relationship between him and Ritra in a way where, like, I when, I just imagined him as a kid growing up, taking on the responsibility of his duty and being a kid, but, like, just talking to Ritra. Yeah. It, it, it isn't just, I am your god. It is, there is a, a, a clear kinship, right? Yes. Yeah, and I get, we've talked a lot about Vritra, so we can kind of move on from there, which is we return from Thabnair and kind of come up with uh, meet, all the scions meet, to get, uh, meet together. And one of the things that I really love is you sort of plan the attack on the Tower of Zot. And yes. I love that they break up the scions in a way that makes sense, right? They're like, okay, we're, we're going to have this group who goes heals, goes and heals to make sure everyone you know, stays alive. And it's like, okay, that's a great way to mechanically make sure that we don't have too many people to pick from in the trust. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that they choose to send Ishtola with the healer group because you know she is yeah. still a pretty talented conjurer. Yes, it's it's. I thought I noticed that as well, and I love that the two different lines. You get different lines depending on if you say what about Alice or what if you say about um, Alfino. Alice gets really upset because I think oh Graha makes fun of her because it's like I remember at the Grand Cosmos that as long as you were next to the, to the Warrior of Light, you fought a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, that's why she steals the um, the LB. Yep, Ali say be crushing on wool. Uh, and she then does. I, I just have a note here, which is just Scion's got so much by energy. They really do. They really <laughs> do. Um, whether they like it or not, just as a byproduct of the fact that they created the Warrior of Light can be either gender, and they didn't change the lines that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they um, seem to be happy with it. Actually, they don't mind yeah. playing into it. Yeah, they absolutely seem to be perfectly happy with it. And look. I'm happy to have it be. I remember when I started playing ARR that there is a, a couple in near the ruins of Nim actually, two 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 male characters that uh, have, you know, they don't have dialogue the way you speak to them, but you know the speech bubbles that pop up above certain minor NPCs' yeah. heads uh, that imply they might be dating. At, at least that was my Aww. read. This was many years ago, but I mean, it's, it's stuff like you know the game doesn't restrict marriage. Yeah, no, it's very. I don't mean this in any way, but it's very progressive, especially for like Japanese yeah. game companies are not always the most better than Atlas. Yeah. 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 But yeah, the fact that it's it's also allowed to just kind of be free floating is like people just love people. Don't worry about it. it yeah. It, I, like that's the attitude to go with. Um, Pretty much. Yeah. Well, and, and like the fact that you, depending on how you read Grahatia, right, you can absolutely see his him at his feelings as admiration and friendship. You could see it as somewhat like romantic as you're, like there's a but a lot of people see it as romantic. <laughs> it, I and I think there's absolutely room to read that. I just yeah, love that I do there's too. enough room 
to see it as you will, right? Like there's enough room that is simultaneously not, we're not going to actually have a stance, but also enough room that there's, but there's, there's a room to, to, to feel different ways about it and read it slightly differently because it's not entirely explicit. Yeah, I think Nineri is a, a warrior of light, not Nineri is a character in, in the Aeolian Archives canon. Um, yeah. Is, is is still not over harsh font, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, that's a whole discussion I would love to have at some point, which is the delineation between you as a player and the and you as a warrior, and the Warrior of Light. Because, like, yeah. I don't see... I'm not the Warrior of Light. The Warrior of Light has its different personality to necessarily me, and, and that's de- evolved and slightly changed and come to fruition through the playing of the game. And so, on occasion, usually I'm in the same line, but on occasion I'll pick a dialogue choice that's more in line with the Warrior of Light's... Yeah. My, oh, my yeah. perspective of the Warrior of Light than necessarily exactly what I would pick. Yeah, definitely. And so then we go to Zot. Yeah, I love Zot. I think it's a good dungeon. I don't think there's any bad dungeons in Endwalker. That's true. Oh my god, the dead ends is so good. Um, I I've played. I have not. I have not hyperbolically, but actually played the dead ends, getting close to a hundred times now. Yeah, it's so good though. It's uh, so good. I really liked that they brought the hypertuned back in Zart. That was yes. cool. Yes, really smart use of them. Um, I like that some of the tempered Imperials in there have obviously been over tempered, like the drowned have. They've not abandoned that concept. Yes, and they've started to their physical forms have started to, to yeah change and and more. Um, which also can make you feel a little less bad about killing them, because once that yes. happens, there's not anything yeah. to do. There's no bringing them back, sadly. Uh, what are the bosses again? Uh, the bosses it's are... the sisters, isn't it? Right, that's right. It's the sisters. Um, the sisters are fun fights. Um, yeah. I like the sisters. Yeah, each one is like its own like little mechanical thing, and then you get to the end, and it's all of the mechanics put together. Yeah. It's that great thing that I love that they do in the Alliance Raids and other stuff, which is introduce a mechanic, reinforce a mechanic, take away the training wheels. But then yeah, doing build that on with it. multiple layers. Yeah, it's really good. I like that they um they innovate on the names. It's not um Cindy, Sandy, and Mindy. It's like was it like Minerva? Uh yeah, stuff yes, like yes. that. They 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 sort of develop the names. Cinderva, Thanderva, and Minerva. And make them work in Favnarian culture. Ah, oh, Min, Min, Minduva. Minduva. It's uh, a U-R-U-V-A. There we go. We'll get it at some point. I'll, I'll look that up. So we fight to the top. And then we find the core. Yes, which is an arm. Which houses... Well, interestingly, it states a limb. But I always imagine an arm, too. You know what's oh. funny? She technically states, I, I just know, I noticed this, but she says a limb, and yet I always think of an arm in there. Yeah, I guess it's weird to think of someone's leg. Yeah, uh, someone, right. Someone, of course, being Varys. Yes, it being the body part of Varys, which is, I feel like I should have put together ahead mm-hmm. of time, but yeah. it's, yet again, I was just like so on that ride for Endwalker, I'm like, well, I couldn't, I, I wasn't sure what the, what, why, what it was. I had proposed that it would be Zenus's mother, because yes, of course, Anima is Seymour's mother in yes. Ten, and a lot of parallels. Yeah, so I'd propose that. I mean, it makes absolute sense that it would have been Varys. I should have really thought of that. We, but you know, um, I think the fact that the the thing that comes at the bottom of Anima doesn't look much like Varys, I suppose, uh, looks well, maybe a little the, bit more feminine. So what I do love is have you looked at it in four, fourteen closely? Not massively closely. Like, looked at it, yes. Studied it, no. So it looks like it has a crown. It actually does, the 14 version actually does look a lot more like Varys than the original, which is definitely more feminine. They actually did Uh, tweak it a bit. Oh, that's cool. The other thing I like is that there are actually some other visual tweaks to Anima, whereas his arms are bound in a, like, cuff chain versus the Anima of Ten, where she's bound with her arms crossed and chains wrapped around her. So, like, there are actually a, l- a bunch of, like, little details that it makes so much sense. Uh, and the idea that it also, what the towers did kind of always was in line with what I expected them to do. I think the main difference being I expected the gateway of the gods to be more about them creating a portal to either another, to other shards or to get mm. to the moon. I wasn't necessarily expecting a giant laser cannon to space. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's cool though. <laughs> it's cool. No, it's cool, and it's 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 fourteen doing that thing where it rides the line of just 
just before being ridiculous and instead it works and it totally works but it's 10% more and it would have been like okay guys come on yeah <laughs> yeah I mean I was worried that going to the moon would I mean that we had the means we've had the means since we went into coil essentially because you just repair an Allegan spaceship enough which is you know an easier task but easier than done but space travel has been a thing since 2.0 plausibly 1.0 uh, I mean, at the very least, the end of 1.0. Yeah. I mean, uh, we knew Dalmud existed and was his moon, ergo, you know, something. You know, like, yeah. like you could have been in... Uh, well, and also, no, they also stated that their original intent for 1.0 was to at some point go to the moon. Like, that was yeah. a big part of their original vision. So that definitely was on the table. Yeah. Oh, on the topic of the moon now, I, I did I did say, didn't I, um, when, we, when I was playing through in the chat... Uh, what is Menfina the god of now? I feel bad for her. <laughs> None <laughs> yeah. of the moons are real. Uh, uh, yep, I got nothing. <laughs> uh, Menfina is the god. You know what? No, I got an answer for you. Her symbol just becomes a loperate. Oh, perfect. perfect. You know, bunnies on the moon. Bunnies on the moon. Obviously, we know that um, Tsukiyomi is based on the Japanese moon rabbit, um, but... Yes. I like to imagine in universe that there is someone. Someone once somehow met a Loperit, and that's the root for the myth of Tsukuyomi. Yeah, that's what yeah. I like to imagine. That's fantastic. Oh, I'd love that. That's great. That I really like that idea. I, we get. I love some of the theories that either we come up with or just like that I get bandied about that I had never even considered. With <laughs> so we destroy the core, and despite thinking their plan through, the group did not think their plan through, and it starts to fade. And then Graha is a major badass and creates a float spell for... Her. I love it because at first you see all the Scions are safe in some Matanga, and then like they say something like, oh, he'll be fine, and it pans out, and there's just like an island full of unconscious Matanga. Yeah. I, I, it's like <laughs> Nuncrimp level stuff, right? Teleporting yeah. the boat. It, it's really cool. I, I love it. Um, I really like that Graha is not just like his goofy self anymore. He... he I mean, he comes through in the, the, not the trial, but, you know, the interrogation by the forum and says, I have experience governing nations. Yes, um, yes, I love that nod. And he comes through in this with the float spell. It's just a really nice, nice callback, I suppose, to his capabilities. Well, and this is similar to Amon, though not quite the same, but I have, I think I've talked about this elsewhere. I don't know of any content we have. It's really important in my mind, I think explicitly with the function of how soul and memory is made clear to work, that Graha is on the source. The Graha we have now is not the Crystal Exarch and is not the Graha from the Crystal that was locked away in the Crystal Tower. Yeah. Because when you combine souls, and especially when you combine memories from people at different points in times and different dispositions, it affects their personalities. The Graha we met in the Crystal Tower, which much younger, more youthful, more like eager. And the Crystal Ta Exarch was much more world weary and serious. And the Graha we get as he becomes a scion is clearly just more energized and um, fresh faced. Yeah. And while the Crystal Exarch, yes, was like clearly more happy once the, the, the first was saved, he, there's still a certain amount that you can clearly tell there's like a youth to mm -hmm. Raha on the source that is not present in the Exarch. Which I'm really glad about because I, I remember discussing this with you actually as that just in the, it, it was probably after one of the law talks. We, we were discussing and I said, um, I kind of feel like we killed Graha Tia um, yeah. by forcing, by putting, not forcing that, I'm sure he consented, but by yes. putting the, 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 the Exarch into him. But thankfully it's more of a synthesis than, yes. than anything else. And I think that's the right way to take it. And I just think that that's really cool. I think it's a new, yet again, one of those like nuances where if you're paying att close attention to dialogue and his disposition and his personality, it's readily apparent. But yeah. if you're not looking closely, it's very easy to just be like, oh, the Exarch's in Graha's body from the source now, which I totally understand. I just, I think it's a distinction worth making clear. Yeah, I think, well, obviously both Exarchs were a little bit like um, Warrior of Light fanboy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, th I think the younger Exarch shines through when you go to Charlene. If you take, if you say um, Champion of Eorzea as your job, yes. which I didn't do because I thought it was Im imprompt to say that to a Charlene yeah. bar border agent. Um, but Graha, like, strikes a big pose and says, um, and he deserves the title as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
Oh, I love that. Oh, that's really cute. Also, there's the thing is, all the Matanga are still tempered. If mm. they all woke up at the same time, like, if they all yes. woke up real quickly, <laughs> like, the entire time I was just thinking, quick, get them back to the city. Get them. Yeah. Get them, <laughs> get them yeah, in. It was a, to... Yeah, it was worrying. And th this is, like, a thing, right? Imagine trying to... Imagine if we hadn't figured out tempering. This this storyline would have been... Impossible. Really very different. Yeah. yeah. Freeing them all would have become... I mean, I'm sure that we would have still kept them captive like we did with uh, Gabu. Um, we wouldn't have I just, don't like... Know. I don't you think, think we could have. No, because think about the amount of people who are tempered. I think it just becomes a, a, a tragic bloodbath. I think I think when it comes to the Matanga, we don't kill them off. Mm. But well, when well, it... where's Razad Han going to house them long term? Yeah, they do seem to have a lot of resources, though. Yeah, no, I want to believe. I want to believe, but a lot of me worries that the practicality of keeping one tempered kobold who's able to keep his shit together is quite different than an army yeah, of tempered. It is. Yeah. Arkasotra. Yeah. <laughs> just, just. A realistic practice, you know, because there's all the stories, you know, going on uh, throughout 2.0 and, you know, like the summer storyline about the guy and his brother, where, you know, even one person being tempered is a major problem. And, and, and the thing yeah. where it's like often mercy killings are still the common place. I mean, in the Amalsha storyline, you do that. You kill what's its mom, don't you? Well, you find her. I don't know that you kill her. Oh, is she still alive? Well, that would be a hopeful. Or thing. does she kill her? Does she kill her? She the I don't the, remember. the Makote might be the one that kills yeah, her. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. I like the Amalja story. Yeah, I think the Aramborn beast tribes, while not at the heights of the later some of the later beast tribes, I think they have a lot of really good shit going on. Yes. Right. Um. Shall we move on to post up? Yeah. So, so well. So the last kind of thing we had to hit on is. Uh, talking to Vitra, who ta who confirms that Midgard Summer arrived post-Sundering, which is really cool to know. And that, which is kind of, we assumed, but is it because of his Pact of Heidelin and stuff, but it wasn't entirely clear exactly when he arrived. And he also arrived, according to Vitra, long after the Sundering, so probably at the earliest 9,000 years ago, and possibly even later into the first Astral Era, but probably, probably in prehistory. Yes, yeah. And Midgard Summer refers to Heidelin as the last bastion of hope. Yes, very, very clearly for sure. In fact, my initial notes before I played the through the whole thing, I, I say, our star was the last bastion of hope for mid Midi, um, then dead universe. So it, they, they yeah. really sort of like, they, they tease out the concept of the universe being dead. Um, I thought that might be a future expansion, to be honest. Um, but yeah. they don't, you know, they, they still keep the core of it, the cause of it, the, the significance of it hidden. It's really interesting to note, too, that Midgard Summer, according to Ritra, was aware of Heidelin's plan. Like, he knew yes. about, which is very, very interesting to know. I also really love the line that Ritra has about his silence. What, what is it? Um, I have it written down. Silence in the face of thine actions is a sign of his greatest approval. Which is just like, oof, that yeah. feels good. Oh. It does, yeah that he's not choosing to speak because he's still probably exhausted after Omega is not a byproduct of him being like, I can't. It's a byproduct of him being like, I believe in you. You've got this. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love, I, I would love to hear more from Midgard Summer. I mean, I think we do hear from him when we go to meet Tiamat, don't we? So it, it's pretty recently. Um, am I remembering that right? I, th I think I he He does when we go to meet her in Heaven's Word, but I don't think he does. When oh, we maybe I'm confusing the two then. 5.x because i'm maybe sure i was just dreaming of that yeah well i, I mean it's possible the 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 because he's still in his dreams after wait spend, spending so much energy dealing with omega and then we the only it as far as we know it takes at least 200 years or 100 years or some such before he can awaken again because he does it in the shadow bringers eighth number calamity timeline yes that's right uh, yeah, that's right. But I, I, I kind of assume that a little, little tiny Midgard Summer will will come out when we meet Asdaja, maybe or something like that. I think you're right. I think there's a good chance that within sooner than that in our timeline, he he will awaken to an extent again. Yes. Um, the then we're kind of like going into the very last things, which is so we get the uh, warding scales, the and we're, we mentioned you know sort of the alliance preparing to assault Garlemald calls out to Boja and Dalmasca. Mm -hmm. And I love that Boja, Dalmasca, and Whirlit somewhere gets a rep, get all get call outs. Yeah, with the, with Dalmasca you have the, the tears of um what is it, Lethis? 
Tears of Len um yeah, I can't find it, but it's it's, it's something like that. Yeah. Uh, you get all the different groups that you've dealt with, the Bojan Resistance, you know, it's just, it's great that everything you've done matters. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the fact that your fights are not disconnected from each other. Yes. Yeah, it, it does, it does feel like that. It does feel like a building of the, of our United. experience in the game. Yeah, absolutely. And that feeling that our and so that goes into the last thing I want to talk about um, right before Akasha is just Nadana that, that when, you know, when she sort of breaks down and that she, you know, she says that our work matters, that it was worth it. And that, that idea that our sacrifices mean something hits so hard in that moment, right? That, that feeling that she, they had worked so hard and sacrificed so much and it is going to save lives and it's going to matter. And that's just, yeah. Mm. So, on to the final thing, which is Akasha, or Dynamis. Yes. Um, they also demonstrate that there are three types of ether here, right? Soul, memory, and corporeal. These are three different types of ether. Yes. So, well, okay. So, the way, so I just wrote a 50 minute piece on this, and actually I'm in the middle of recording it. Right, yes. Uh, it, there is incorporeal ether and corporeal ether. Yeah. Memory and soul both are a form of incorporeal aether and are distinct from each other, but co-related and intrinsically yeah. linked. So what this does, and, and what we get, we get a whole thing with um, uh, Montache later where he does his whole lesson on that, which I, where I've cut this off is we're, we're going to stop at Akasha. And so we're going to pick up the next episode with that sort of speech. So but we get some confirmation and allusion to the idea, yeah, that they're like the stinks aethers and all these things and the corporeal and incorporeal, but then there's the separate to all of that, which is Akasha or Dynamis. And that is a whole fucking thing. Yes, it is a massive, massive undertaking to even discuss. Um, Akasha, Akasha, sorry, um, and Dynamis are revolutionary to our understanding of the world um and yet have been foreshadowed in questions throughout for instance like well what is limit what are limit break like limit yes. breaks don't really make sense except for they do under the idea and the auspice of such things existing yes um yes it is and, and it, it's almost presented that Dynamis at, at first is presented that Dynamis is weaker than Aether. This is, but it turns out this is probably because it's more subtle in certain ways than Aether until it's not, at which point it becomes very, very much overpowering, even for the strongest of people. And they do the whole dark matter analogy where there is the thing, the important thing though, is that there's also more Dynamis in existence than there yeah. is uh, Aether. And so, I, I wonder if that's natural or if that's a result of Meteon. So my guess is it's natural, and the reason being that there's a statement that like Aether, Akasha can neither be created nor destroyed, which mean, to me marks the idea that there's just the amount of dynamics right. there was in the universe to begin with. Ergo, okay. Meteon is just able to pull upon a much larger store of it than there is Aether. It also seems like Dynamis can exist in the vacuum of space, in a way that Aether struggles to and Aether kind of dissipates. Yeah. Which is a whole thing. But so it's, you know, emotional power. It's it's kind of a nebulous concept because it's not so simple as emotions. Yes. But it is also energy that is affected by and influenced by emotion. And yeah. one way to think of it is spirit or will. Yes. It, it, it it's emotions is an understatement. Obviously it's linked to emotions. But it almost seems as if it is the... I mean, it can affect corporeal things. The, 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 word, the, the things of Ultima Soul, which I don't necessarily think are the planets. Um, you know, I, I think that the representations or maybe fragments of the planets that have been pulled in. But the interactions of, of um, Akasha or whatever else you want to call it, whichever other term you want to call it, and ether are something that bears sort of endless discussion going on. I can imagine for years we will be discussing this. Well, and I, I assume we are in no way done with it as a notion. Like it is going to continue to be oh, yeah. the perspective of, of some 
import throughout. Yes. Even if, even if just the patch content of Endwalker, which I assume beyond, but but the like trials and just alliance raids, and I'm sure there's all sorts to be considered and done with that. I mean, and if you think about it, in a way, the time that we're least likely to encounter it is when dealing with the Unsundered World, because part of the reason that the Unsundered World is the way it is is that it's so etherically dense that all Dynamis is drowned out. Yes. Well, not all, but it easy, is easily drowned out. It's it's forced into an undertone type situation. Yeah. Do you have any sort of final thoughts on Akasha or anything? Uh, not on Akasha. I have some thoughts on Tavnir. Okay. Well, I have one final thing I want to say on Akasha that made me fucking scream, which is and and laughter, and that is the line. Some say it's given from on high or torn from the heavens. Some say, torn from the heavens is the Warrior of Lights theme. Yes, yes. And I was just like, those right. motherfuckers! <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't resist poking us. Yeah, and of course, it, it, it's on top of that, yes, it is the, the Warrior Lights set theme, but it's also literally being sent from the heavens and bouncing off Zodiac's barrier. Yep. yep. Well, yep. you know, barrier isn't the right term for it, but his strengthening of the, the celestial... The ethereal set. shroud. Yeah. Yeah, the, the shroud that he uh, puts around at Theris. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait till I can actually get to a point where I can just say a Theris without people, like, without it feeling yeah. a spoiler. We'll, we'll wait a bit. We'll wait, like, a patch or two, I think we said, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, I think at least a patch. Well, then, let's get to your final points on a Thavnir and sort of wrap things up. Okay, so I, I like that when you run around Thavnir, you see mulberry trees, um, because these are the trees that silkworms uh, require to survive. Oh. Um, huh. And... It's a really great detail. Yeah, it's a really, really cool detail. And I mean, obviously, in Japan, the silkworm is an important part of culture. So it makes sense that they'd be aware. Uh, like the Empress of Japan tends to a mulberry garden um, as mm -hmm. part of her duties. So, you know, it's important in the culture, but it, it's really nice to see it represented. Um, uh, obviously, uh, silk began to be produced across India and Iran. Um, which are areas that inspire Thavnes. So there's another cultural touchstone there. Um, it was particularly produced in the Caspian, sort of the Caspian Sea area of Iran. Um, which there's a lot to say that, you know, the Caspian is one of the inspirations for the bounty in some ways. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, what else did I have to say? Um, oh yeah, I've got a note here saying, as Daja must be in the new world that I must have made at the yeah. time. Uh, Absolutely. I also wondered if... So you know how the, the new structures of Fandaniel's Garlemald, so the big citadel that was erected over Garlemald and the towers are organic? I sort of wondered personally if that has anything to do with the fact that they are tied around an organic object, tied around a, a body part of Varys. Well, it seems like they, they are supposed to be in visual alignment with Anima itself, and therefore I would think that that's very much a possibility. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at first, when I first saw them, when I first saw the inside of the tower, I thought, is this Mac? Yeah. Well, and also the, like, bridges that come out during, like, Zot and stuff, right? They look like vertebrae. Yeah, and, they do. And so I think I think you're onto something in that that would make a lot of sense, that they're so Geiger organic-esque. seeing as Yeah, they, they are, are very Geiger, actually. Body parts and suffering. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, next time, yeah. I suppose that we'll start with the Ilsabard contingent, right? That's that, that yeah. sort of stuff. So, I guess that wraps up our first episode of End Talkers. It certainly does. It's been a pleasure. It has been a bit of pleasure. Did you? Uh, I feel like I'm going to remember the events of End uh, Endwalker a lot better after doing this. I agree. You know what they say: um, the best way to learn is to teach. Okay. Well then. Thank you all for listening, and uh, please like, comment, and subscribe. The usual, you know, necessary things to say for a channel, but we, again, do really appreciate it, and it's super helpful. We do. Um, feel free to check out the site, uh, and please leave us any feedback that you have on the um, uh, below the video, and we also have a Discord that will be linked in the description. And with that, bye, everyone. Bye-bye. This content was brought to you by the Eorzean Archives. If you enjoyed this video, help us please the 12 by leaving a like and subscribing for new content every Thursday, and comment down below with any topic you'd like to see our Archons cover in the future. For even more content, discussion, and exclusives, please check out our Discord and consider supporting us on Patreon.